All right. So, everybody, I think we're live. Thank you so much. Appreciate if you're uh, joining us. Uh, we'll just wait a moment and get some people on. But today, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different compared to the uh, last couple of weeks. A software package. I hear myself. And so I'll turn that off. And now that should be good. Um, everybody, Tyler Stumpf, the one and only, here with me again every other week, it seems like, um, doing the GPR data processing show for Bigman Geophysical and Learn GPR. So um, Tyler is in charge of our online e-learning and as well as our software uh, uh, demos and training. If you have any questions about GPR data processing software packages, reach out to us, uh, leave a comment below or go to bigmangeo.com and fill out a contact form and Tyler or myself or one of our other people get back to you, but it'll likely be Tyler or myself. And uh, we're here to help. I mean, Tyler has a, a four hour training he's doing with one of our new customers for GPR Slice later this afternoon or evening. Yep. Uh, it's evening because they're all the way on the West Coast. And by West Coast, I mean further out West than California. Yes. Um, so we're here to help you. And as part of that mission, we are going to come to you live with some content um, every single, I guess, every other week and uh, do some, 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 some data processing for you. So today what we're going to do, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. And again, if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel, uh, help us, you know, reach more people. And do me a favor if you're on right now, and obviously we have a couple people on already who pop, popped in, do me a favor and share this live feed to either LinkedIn or Facebook um, so we can try to attract some more folks. All we're trying to do is help people. Uh, that was our mission to begin with. However, during all this you know, global slowdown, we're trying to give even more value and information to people as best as we can. So just do us a favor and go ahead and um, share the video. So we're going to get into it now. And, uh, and, and we'll go ahead and we're going to pop up Echo Project this time. So Echo Project is the proprietary, let's see here, uh, software package for sensors and software. And um, it, sorry. And so in this software package, you can only process data that was collected with the sensors and software unit. And so that's an LMX 200 or a Noggin or a uh, uh, Conquest. Uh, or or an echo uh, pulse echo rather, and so we are big fans of the noggin, and uh, uh, and and we use that on site along with a handful of other units, of course, as we are you know big proponents of multi vendor. However, uh, what we're going to go ahead and do and make a point today is that no matter how much you process your data, okay, no matter how much you process it, it still may not show everything you want it to show in the 3D perspective or in the time slice perspective or view. And so uh, what we're gonna do here is show, you know, we're gonna process some information, portray it as time slice. It's gonna look good. You're gonna see the septic tank that we're looking for. Uh, but what we didn't get to see, no matter how much processing we did, was the feeder line to that septic tank from the building to the septic tank. And, uh, and then what we want to make the point here is, is that, um, is that you, you can't not use profile view in order to help make interpretations. Uh, profile really are the data. In reality, even the profile is an interpolation of the wiggle traces. So going from profile to 3D time slices or pseudo 3D time slices is an interpolation of interpolations. And so uh, you sometimes just lose some stuff along the way and in this case, we definitely lost the feeder line. You kind of can see it, but it's tough uh, uh, to really get a good, a good view of it because the background is so, so noisy. So here is the deal. I'll show you the GPS. So this was our track across this area. Uh, we did, and actually it was collected by uh, Dominic who runs our uh, field operations and project support division. And so he collected this for a customer, excuse me. And, uh, uh, and they was in search of a, uh, of a septic tank. And so what he did basically just to give you kind of his, his approach to this was he started wide and then came in as he identified what he believed was the septic tank. And so as he's kind of going, you know, through, uh, uh, you know, through, through these, here's what, here was his path, right? So he's doing these long lines that are kind of separated, you know, by, by a little bit. 
as he finally comes in and focuses onto the, the tank itself later on, he comes in and he does much shorter lines right over it, both directions, um, to really get a good visual on it. So that's what he did. All right, so let's go ahead and process these lines as, uh, 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 as, as time slices. And um, in order to do that in Echo Project, if you have GPS coordinated information, you can do what's called a slice view based on lines instead of a grid. And so you just click slice view lines and it gives you a handful of options here that you can choose from. So you have kind of basic stuff or advanced. And so I uh, will go ahead and call this slice set three and kind of pull through here. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Is it pulling that velocity directly from the machine when you did your hyperbola fit in the field? So it generally, um, from what we have identified is not. So what we would do here, uh, it's a great, great question, is uh, we would go in and actually record what the velocity is from a hyperbola fit. Um, and in this case, you know, we're gonna, we'll make an assumption that we're hitting something at, at an angle uh, that's reasonably perpendicular. Um, you know, and so for example, oh, let me find a good line to do this here. So maybe one of these lines. So if you just double click on the actual line, it'll bring the line up in a line view window and it'll allow you to process that um, window or that line just as is, right? So okay. here's the line and you can go in and drop any line in that you want. You know, it's, it's, it's up, to the, up to the user, okay? So um, what we'll do is we can go ahead and do a hyperbola fit here. Actually, I mean, we can go ahead and clean, you know, might as well just go through and show Show cleaning up a little bit. So you get some, you know, you have the option for background subtraction or hmm. not. You can see it removes the direct wave, obviously. Uh, horizontal banding was not too particularly bad in this case, right? So yeah. uh, not too bad. But we can go ahead and do a background filter. We can adjust the gains here. It gives us a few options. So we can kind of just you know, increase gains. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, or decrease gains. Totally up to us. Um, or we can do an auto set for gain. Right, so it gives you the option to do an auto. Hmm. Actually, the auto tends to be pretty good with the uh, Echo Project. And so it's gonna be using an AGC gain. Uh, yep. Let me see here. So settings, we'll go to gains. And uh, in this case, it's using an SEC gain too. This is, I have found to be particularly the, 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 the best option um, in Echo Project. It kind of fits what my expectations are. Hmm. Okay. And so this is, you know, as you bring this, this interpretation um, or or, or um, uh, filter menu up, <clears throat> then wherever you are on any profile, it's going to show you the wiggle trace where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's going to show you what the raw is and what your processed is, right? So, so the black here is the raw, the red is the processed, and if you want to see your gain curve, you can see what your gain curve is. And so, you know, you can adjust that, right? So if we went, if we did a something like that, right, which is pretty dramatic. Now, obviously it's all changed, right? So I did a user gain level that was just overwhelming. And so um, obviously our gain curve change and all of our gains change. So if we go back and we do an auto set, which again, I think was, was pretty good, it's gonna give us an appropriate level gain. So you can, you, you can kind of see, you can make those choices uh, as you're going with it. Yeah. Um, and so that's what it is, you know, and in this case, right? So same thing, background filter, it gives you the option to, to give a couple different levels of aggressiveness. You know, full length is gonna be the full length of the profile. Um, so if we preview that one, right, it removed it. If we wanted to be really aggressive, uh, then we could be really aggressive and go to, you know, half a meter or whatever, uh, or it's in feet, so maybe half a foot, right? So obviously it takes a lot out yeah. when you go hyper aggressive like that. Um, I don't think we really even need it much. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it out for, for now, or, or maybe we'll do just a, just a full length. Um, but that's it. Yeah. So you have kind of, a, a, a some options here. Uh, you have an option for, you know, D wow, just on or off. Right. So that's, and it wasn't particularly bad here, but you can see some of that vertical striping. Uh, we'll just obviously keep the D wow on. They by default, keep it on. Okay. Because it's a collecting information in the field with the D wow filter on. So they just keep it that way. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, it gives you a band pass uh, categories. And so you can kind of just, just peek out small, you know, high frequency stuff. Like you just want to see high frequency. You just want to see low frequency. Um, or you just want to see, you know, kind of that middle range frequency. You know, it's sort of your choice. Yeah. Um, or you can just 
not cut it and see everything that that came in. Hmm. Right. So it gives gives you some options. Let's go ahead and cancel this out. Oops. I canceled that out. And um, so to do the hyperbola fit, right? We just click this. It brings up our our hyperbola here. Um, and so we may have done this already because you can see it actually kind of it's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty well. <laughs> yeah. So 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 it obviously we have done it and it pulled it from there. Yep. Um, so we'll keep it as is now in the field, right? But if we wanted to, if it was different, you know, obviously we would change it and then it would just allow us to have a new, a new option. So if I click out, um, you know, we'll just go back to the, to the other option. So, it, so, so we did a, a, a fit on it and it has an appropriate, um, appropriate velocity. So we'll go ahead again and do this line set uh, slice view. Um, and everybody who's watching, and I, and I appreciate everybody here. Uh, thank you so much, Lee uh, McNichol. I see that you, you had uh, made a, a comment. Um, we appreciate We're trying hard to help people. Uh, and if you're in the, in, in the watching right now live, um, again, do us a favor is number one, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. Number two is please share this on LinkedIn. Just all it takes is pressing a button, press it, share it on LinkedIn. We would really appreciate it. And then third is let us know what software package you use to process data. Put it in the comments or in the feed, and uh, we'll try to get that you know a, a video up about your software package. So go ahead and, and and put that in. And if you have any questions, please let us know as we're kind of walking through this. Uh, kind of ask questions as they come up. If you have any specific um, kind of needs, yeah, based on what we're doing. Ask questions. We're trying to help. That's it. So um, okay. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to obviously keep the velocity, which looked pretty good. Advanced. Um, you know, we're going to go ahead and just leave uh, these as is. Um, because, of, you know, we're going to obviously do a DWOW. We saw that it's going to benefit from the DWOW because there's a little bit of a vertical striping. Background subtraction, this is going to be, uh, I mean, we could tur turn this off because it's not too bad. But if we leave it on, it'll do a very broad-based filter because it's at zeros. The envelope is going to be um, Hibbert transform. And that's going to help kind of visualize things in slices. Uh, and, and, and we go through this in detail in our online program, mm -hmm. uh, data processing. We go into migration and Hibbert transform and why those are critical when you're doing slice projections. Um, and what the problem is, is if you don't migrate and, and do an envelope, we show that in the course. Um, and then, of course, we'll leave the game on, right? So we'll just go ahead and, and, and leave this on. We'll leave this auto. Has the velocity set. For gain, we can go ahead and do auto as well, but it does give you the option to adjust uh, user level. Um, and it even gives you the option to choose what part of your window you want to gain up, right? So maybe you have enough gain in the beginning and you just don't want to start it at, you know, at, 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 at 0.5 uh, uh, in your trace. You know, you can go ahead and start it somewhere, somewhere below that. It, mm -hmm. It's your choice. Uh, auto gain looked pretty good. So we'll just keep that. Finally, for the slices, um, I happen to like Jet. I don't know what you like. Um, I don't know, Tyler, why don't you give me a- Jet or, looks normal. I want to stick with like? normal. Let's just stick with normal. Jet stick with jet? Normal. You don't want to go, you don't want to go with, um, with no, that? No prism. Prism? Is, is there, where's the flag option? The flag is go to in flag. here. So, that's, that's the option. Where is flag? Yes. That's it. Uh, that's it? Flag that's what you're using? is it. Yeah. All right. Maybe, maybe in the next video, we'll do flag. <laughs> Today, we're going to keep it as jet, um, which I find to be uh, uh, the most appealing and easy to understand, usually. Okay. Well, and it's kind of the industry standard, right? Generally, that's what the color palette looks like for, yes, for slices. For slices. Yeah, just like industry standard is grayscale for profiles, but people do alter it sometimes, and sometimes there's a reason to. Yeah. Um, but for, for in general, it's, you know, these are typical. Okay, so for thickness, um, this is how thick each slice is going to be. So it's defaulting to about uh, um, four inches. We'll go ahead and, and, and keep that for now. And so we can always see, like, if it's if it's too fine, we can always expand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can keep it for there now. Overlap, we tend to do overlaps of about 50%. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in Echo Project, I'll do a little bit less. And then for max slice depth, uh, it, it, again, it's up to us. Most of what we're looking for is within the top few feet. And so, I mean, it's really, we're looking at the top. Let's see. Um, I think it was a top, like, three. Top, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we could cut this down if we wanted to, you know, maybe we'll cut it to, you know, six or something like that. And, um, and then finally we're going to do interpolation. So for interpolation it has a few options. Low means it's going to be the 
uh, um, you know, it's going to spread the widest. Pixels are going to be the lo- largest. Uh, the radius for where it's gra- gathering information from is going to be wide. And so for low, it's going to be every 3.28 feet uh, you know, over a meter. Uh, to me, you know, it's going to be, um, we can actually do two of them and show them at different different levels. Um, a lot of times we'll use advanced to just do what, what we want. Um, you know, but it also depend on how far apart your transects are. Right? Yeah. So if your transect is a meter apart, you might have to go low to get overlap. Second is you might not care about overlap because you still might be able to see what you're looking for anyway. Um, and in this case, again, he's Dominic started wide range until he focused in on what we were looking for and then went really close. Uh, um, but why don't we go ahead and, and, and we'll do a, a high. So this is saying a neighborhood radius of less than a foot um, and pixel width is going to be 0.16 of a foot. So it's going to be really, um, really tight grid. And, uh, and then we'll just process it. And so once we process, it'll run through the whole deal. It may take a moment because there's 95 uh, lines that it's gonna that it's gonna go through, and we'll see what we see. Now, here was the point of this: was that we're gonna take a look at what this septic tank looks like in slice view, and whether or not we can see the septic tank. And then the second thing we're gonna look at is can we see the feeder line from the building to the septic tank, and um, and then we'll make a determination, you know, based on. On, on that. And, uh, and once we do that, we'll be able to look and see, um, you know, if profiles are critical in this case or not. And, and, I, and I really think that, that, that they are. Well, and it kind of builds on a couple of points we've made the last couple of times we've been on YouTube doing this is that we want to look at the most data possible. Right. right. When we, we talked about what method we choose for time zero and why we chose that and why we were raised that way. And for us, it was to see the, you know, don't cut data, see as much of the raw data as possible. Mm-hmm. And that kind of is the same for when you're looking at a radar gram. You sh- like when you're working through it in the field, you're not seeing your slice views often. Some machines allow you to see it as you go, right? Yeah. But generally you're looking at the 2D. So start at the 2D and yeah. then move forward. And so this is and a really good example of emphasizing kind of the usefulness of both data outputs. 2D. Yep, yep. At a great point where, you know, look, we're of the opinion that not every project needs post-processing, right? I mean, so everyone has different opinions on this, and I'm sure that some people are going to, you know, m- maybe throw us under the bus, um, but we really do feel that way. Sometimes an easy locate just doesn't need a ton of post-processing um, or any, and you're, you know, it's not going to change, right? It's not going to change the way that your interpretations are. Um, excuse me, some definitely need it. But there's two, you know, there's two polarities here. Some people think data processing is just on, you know, d- d- doesn't have to happen ever. And I think that that's wrong. Excuse me. On the other scale or other side of the scale, it's, uh, and I was talking to a customer of ours just the other day who said that, that somebody that they saw on site said that they don't trust anything that comes out unless it's been post-processed. And I think that's a little bit extreme as well, mm-hmm. or quite a bit extreme. And I think there's a happy medium where number one, not all processing needs complex processing, right? And so you can get by with some simple processing. And then second is not all projects even need that. And, you know, some projects, you know, that you'll have will be fine with zero process, you know, and again, maybe you do some pre-processing as we call it, right? Where on your system, you're doing a background filter, or maybe you're doing a band pass, which they have some you know, options for, maybe you're adjusting the gain and you're getting the best visual you can while you're collecting, marking it on ground, GPSing it and getting it to the client. And some of this also has to do with, well, what's the scope of work and what's the budget? Yeah. And if you're not budgeting it in and it's not in the scope of work to produce a deliverable other than a shapefile line or just paint on the ground or whatever, um, is that just might be it. So you know, I'd love for more people to do more processing again, because simplified processing just doesn't take all that long. And, um, you know, and sometimes you do get something out of it. You can clarify some information. And even if it's your interpretations don't change, but your customers have something in front of them, that's easier to explain to a non, you know, user of GPR. I think processing can help in that way too. Not just, you know, prettying it up, Again, I always say don't get into the prettiest picture competition, but sometimes not even prettying it, but just making it a little bit more clear to a customer can can be helpful. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of processing. It's like yeah. the majority of what I do. I love sure. using kind of coming back after you collect your raw data, but there are plenty 
of projects where I've not done or done very little mm-hmm. post-processing. Processing, yeah, we yeah. brought it in, we've created slices to satisfy the customer, but they wanted a raw slice and then maybe it's just a background filter. Or sure. maybe it's just a gain to make sure that you can actually see six or eight feet down. Right. But right. That's like, it. Yeah, po- it's almost sometimes post-processing for the sake of an image or two in a report mm-hmm. as opposed to interpretation. It's like you're already making the interpretations, right? So to run it through for eight minutes, while you're making a report, like what's the difference at that point, right? You pretty yeah. up, you make it, you point some arrows to the stuff that you're talking about. And I think it's also sometimes application dependent, right? Where mm-hmm. a lot of the archeology span and stuff that we do sort of requires more post-processing, oh, yeah. right? If you're trying to find a single feeder line and you see it running to the, to the tank, you probably can just spray it out, right? I mean, it's, it, it's gonna depend, uh, or, or even with uh, concrete, for example, right? Is sometimes, and, and people don't realize this, but doing archeology span or you know, archeological investigations does vary quite a bit across the world, where if you're working in the Southeastern United States, where Tyler and I had both worked and, and have worked in graduate school, um, sometimes you're literally looking for just soil differences. Yeah. So, you know, where, where the, the, the Native Americans who lived at the site built buildings that had, you know, um, wooden posts, those posts have deteriorated over time, so they're organic but it's embedded in a background soil. And you're kind of just looking for very simple differences between soil that was a, a, a wall at some point and soil that was the native soil, right? Versus identifying like, you know, Roman, not to say it's easy because it's not, but Roman remains where you have like, you know, solid walls and foundations embedded in soil sometimes could be easier to see, especially if you have like a basalt rock you know, uh, structure that's embedded in like a limestone sand, like that stuff is really different. And so it's easy to see that sometimes, but nonetheless, as archeology span often requires a bit more processing. Concrete scanning, where sometimes you're finding just embedded steel in concrete, which is such a difference, is plain as day when you're doing it. Now, not to minimize concrete because there's also a lot of complexities. And when was the concrete set and cured? You know, how, uh, complicated is 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 the set of embedments and 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 things like that, um, but nonetheless, is obviously the contrast between steel and and concrete is very different, and you may just not need a lot of processing, right? Or you just might be able to do it on board your system as opposed to bring it all the way to the office. Mm-hmm. And it's contextual too, right? Where when you leave the site doing concrete and you do a two by two, it's going to be hard potentially to replace what you, you know, what you processed later in at you know back back onto the concrete versus archaeology if it's gps integrated like that all plots then and you have posterity for it right so i think that applications will go ahead and uh, um and and influence how much processing is sort of you know required well and it brings it back to the question of scope and deliverables what 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 is in the scope specifically what is your client requiring you to deliver as you said earlier, yeah. if it's just painting a utility on the ground, you might not need any post-processing at all. Mm-hmm. Or you're running out with an LMX 100 and you're just marking as you go or a easy locator or whatever you're using mm-hmm. versus trying to map a complex sewer system where they're going to be digging and replacing utilities to the left and right of it, but they don't want to actually hit the sewer. And they, you know, they need, are you, are you excavating down to three feet? Are we going to hit it? Are we not? Those are the instances where you might need a more intricate post-processing plan so that you can prevent a strike. You can prove mm-hmm. some of the right. catastrophic right. Absol- errors. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. No, it's, it's a really good point, right? It's like, what's happening afterwards? Like, is somebody excavating and they're looking to find it? Is somebody excavating and they're looking to avoid it? You know, that plays a role in kind of what has to be done afterwards. All right. So it looks like we're basically finishing up here. Um, but please, everybody, if you, you know, listen to our discussion, pop in the comments what you think. You know, I mean, you tell, you tell us uh, what your kind of opinion is. Should, should processing be done on every project? Um, should it be done on, on few occasions? Should it be done on, you know, more often than not? Just let us know. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it gives us some feedback about what everybody else thinks about it. Um, so just pop in the comments a, uh, 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 you know, your, your, your opinion. Uh, okay, so it processed it, and now we'll go ahead and we did that as slice set three. So here's the slices. Okay, here's the slices. I'll go ahead and take my GPS uh, off. Um, start this back at the ground. Uh, we don't have a big ground reflection because we removed it with our background. Um, but as we kind of start to go down, like so now we're going down in in uh, uh, in depth. 
there's our tank. Yep. Right. So our tank pops up. Uh, it's right here. I'm not sure if people can see my, uh, my, uh, I think they can, my, my mouse. Um, but it's obviously pretty clear of where the tank, where the tank is. Yeah. Right. So that's the tank. So we're able to see that tank in the 3D time slice. And to show everybody what that looks like, by the way, in, um, um, you know, in, in a profile view. I'll just uh, I'll shoot over to where we hit the tank first. So there it is. Yep. Uh, you know, you can see that tank, you know, very clear. So what, what that tank had was actually a, um, it had a concrete cover on it. And so that concrete cover um, just showed up really well in the in the clay soils that it was embedded in. Right. So there, there it is, right there. That's that's the tank tanks uh, with that concrete cover. So that's easy to see, and that was easy to see in profile view, and it's obviously easy to see in slice view. Um, and so this looks pretty good. I mean, I think we did a decent job as far as the slices go uh, over 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 here. Uh, but to take a look then, where is the feeder line from the building, which was over here, right, to the tank, which is over here? And um, we got a couple of kind of candidates, <laughs> you know, but they don't show up great. So we kind of have something coming out this way, sort of makes its way over, you know, maybe at different, at different depths. Maybe we see a little bit better. Uh, and you can see it kind of starts coming out there and then it kind of fades. Yep. Um, then we have another line, which actually looks like it goes deeper and deeper, which comes out this direction and then curves this way or splits possibly. But as we go down a little bit further, you can see the line come out a little bit more. So now it's coming this direction. And so maybe to capture the line, uh, we could have done a tighter grid, you know, to capture it better. But the line was an afterthought to the project. So they said, find the tank. We found the tank, plain is, you know, very clearly. And then they said, well, can you also send us information on where the feeder line is? And if we had known that going in, um, because we had limited time on site, we would have probably done a tighter grid. But nonetheless, as we did, you know, what, what was required and what was in the scope, but still we're able to give them information about the line. So, well, that's the really important part of making sure that your survey design matches 100%, right? And we'll be having some things upcoming shortly in the next month or so that talk specifically about survey design for yep. different projects. And so I think Absolutely. that's really important yeah. there as well. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and that's why uh, so we, we're going to have a webcast uh, specifically on survey design. Um, and, and, and sometimes, right, maybe it's on us to ask some more probing questions mm -hmm. to the customer and figure this stuff out beforehand. But, you know, it wasn't, you know, we said, you need us to find utilities, said no. And we kind of, lump the line into utilities. And so uh, language definitely plays a role in, in what people consider, um, you, you know, as part of the scope. Nonetheless, is, uh, so it kind of comes in here, but I'd be hard pressed to make that call just based on, on the slice. We do have another line coming up this way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I want to make the point here, right from the beginning is we can start seeing these lines off the side of the building in the profile view. So although we don't get great clarity in the time slice, here's one in the profile and here's the other one in the profile. And so using the profiles is gonna help us actually go back and give the customer the information with confidence that they need that we otherwise weren't able to do. And what we'll do is why don't we go ahead and um, let's just really quickly plot this, um, this line if we can. Uh, we'll kind of do, do our best. And uh, and so here, they make it pretty easy to, let's see, create new interpretation. We'll call it uh, feeder. Uh, we'll make it a pipe, which is a dot. You know, we can choose one different color or not. Uh, so to us, um, why don't we leave it as pink now? Okay. It. And then um, yeah, here it is. And we're not going to go, we're not, we're, we're not getting into a discussion about where do we place the dot and what's the depth and all that now. That's it for another time. Um, and nonetheless, we'll go ahead and place the dot there. And then we'll actually, we can bring up the next line, uh, which doesn't have it. We can bring up the line after that. 
Uh, and so it looks, you know, maybe that it has it, um, but we'll get, we'll get there in just a second. All right, so here we go again. Mm. All right, so now we're able to kind of see, you know, see this. This is also why often, you know, we'll recommend, but this wasn't part of the, of the deal, right? So we often recommend going unidirectional to help with interpretations later on. Um, but go ahead, maybe pop a couple more in just so people can kind of see it. You can actually see this thing kind of jump back and forth. Uh, well, and the reason it's kind of hopping back and forth for at least for this was it was collected in a zigzag pattern, in two, right? In two different directions. That's correct. Right. So that's another important thing to, to kind of think about when you're either trying to interpret or understand any of these feeder lines is how is it collected? Because if it's a zigzag, each radiogram as you go back and forth is you're going to have to look on the opposite side of yep. that radiogram as this you go jumps back, back and, and forth. forth. Yep. Yep. Um, so while we're doing this, we had a question as well. Um, no. so it's a, uh, I know there's no solid answer to this, but can you kind of tell me what is the minimum dimension of objects we can detect in this mm. case? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a great question. Um, and this is something that we do deal with, uh, heavily in our, uh, courses, but certainly we'll give you a, cause it's a, it's a, uh, um, it could be a long winded answer. Yeah. So um, let, let me get out of here real quick. Uh, hopefully, I think it should have retained uh, all my interpretations and, uh, and hopefully we can see them here. Okay, so I, so I was hitting some stuff that, that wasn't even part of it, right? And I started obviously getting, I was hitting both, both lines. <laughs> see, which is why, you know, it, it, it's tough. But we could go in and, and, and uh, remove them. But this was the line here. And when we did this originally for the customer, we, put, we, 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 we had it in where that line fed in. Um, but nonetheless is, uh, uh, go back and, and actually redo some of those. Um, but, but the point is that we can go in and, and we can make those interpretations because it is plain as day right here. And, uh, um, you know, obviously we could go ahead and, and, and do a better, you know, a better, better job. So, um, so to answer the question, what's the size of something that you might be able to see? The way that we do this is, you know, unfortunately, there's, you're right, right? There's no simple answer because, uh, or no exact, let me see exactly what it says. Um, no solid answer. No solid answer because we have found various answers to this question ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I always kind of present two different options here, which is um, one indicates 25% of the GPR's frequency, a uh, wavelength, 25% of the wavelength to get a response off of a, you know, a buried object. And I've seen other authors and researchers indicate 10% of the wavelength. So which one do you choose, right? And the way that we always kind of go about it is, well, choose the 25% so you're um, confident. And if you get better than 25%, it's kind of gravy. And so, you know, recognize too that there's a, when you do the calculation for the central frequency of your antenna, then it's um, it's going to be just for that frequency. However, every antenna is a broadband system. And so you'll put out frequencies plus and minus whatever that central frequency is. In this case, we use a 250 megahertz antenna. And so the 250 megahertz antenna is going to have a, a certain wavelength at 250. But since it puts out plus or minus 50% or so, we're going to actually get the ability to find things that are smaller than what we would expect with a 250. So I think that might be where the 10% versus the 25% comes from. But we generally say, look, it's 10 to 25%. And um, we express it as 25%, recognizing that anything we get that's smaller than 25% uh, of the wavelength for the central frequency is, 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 uh, is, is, right, is gravy is kind of the way that, that, that we look at it. Well, it's the same mindset like when you're interpreting in, in real life, when you're interpreting a utility, uh, you, you're never going to give a depth of 8.256 feet. 
Right. You're going to say, well, you know, the GPR recorded a response at 15 nanoseconds based on some uh, modeling of this speed in the soil. We expect that to be around six feet. Right. So be err on the side of caution when you're making some of these interpretations to ensure that what you're doing is accurate and you're not over kind of projecting what you're, what the data is telling you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're big on, on, on being more cautious, you know, uh, uh, when, when, you, when you can be, um, you know, from a liability standpoint, of course, you know, when we're thinking public sector, you know, that's going to be uh, a big part of it, yeah. you know, is limiting your liability and, you know, and, and erring on the side of, of caution, I think is always going to be, you know, sort of more helpful than, um, than trying to squeeze out every last millimeter, you know, of, of, of accuracy. Um, so, but great question. All right. Uh, other questions. If you have any other questions, uh, you know, go ahead and, and, um, and, and, and put them in, you know, we, we would like to like to hear them. Uh, I kind of will, you know, we'll, we'll let people kind of do that for a second and I'll see if I can clean up some of these interpretations over here. Um, well, and this interpretation is a really clear example of the importance of using your 2D and your 3D data together. Oh, sure. And emphasizing that there's no one correct way back and forth, right? It's important yep. to use all the data at your disposal to make a clear interpretation based on what it's telling you, rather mm -hmm. than just making a slice, running through kind of a normal, oh, I, I always do these processing steps no matter what, and what the time slice shows me is correct. Now, always right. go back, look at your 2D, you know, assess your polarity on your 1D wiggle traces. Like, go back and look at this stuff. Uh, it's going to, this This is where you change your interpretations from kind of really basic stuff. And you can kind of begin yeah. to move into these, it, like, really high-level interpretations so you can deliver to your client a very clear uh, image of the subsurface and what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, okay, so it looks like, do we have any other uh, uh Questions, got a couple people popping on. Thank you so much for popping on. And again, you know, let us know what software you use and we'll jump in and try to help you, uh, you know, with that software uh, on another, you know, on another uh, live kind of broadcast. Um, let's see, Let, you know, we'll go ahead and see if I was able to capture a little bit more of that. We're trying to rush this a little bit, but yeah, so there you go. Oh, much better. So now, yeah, we, yeah. now we have actually, you know, this line comes in, right? And that's, you know, from the interpretations, we can see exactly where it feeds in. And, um, and so the point here is, you know, processing can't fix everything, right? Which is also why we say sometimes, you know, processing isn't always necessary or complicated processing isn't always necessary. Like we see the line here. Could we, Tyler, what do you think? I'm gonna ask, ask you this. Mm -hmm. Could we potentially sit here for a few hours and get a fractional better image of that feeder line in the slice view? Yes. Probably, however, sitting here for six minutes while we're having an actual conversation between us and, and, and with all of our, you know, the folks uh, uh, tuning in, which we appreciate, you know, we're able to find the line. Yeah. Like I'm able to do that uh, now. So obviously I can't do two things at the same time, you know, perfect, which is talk and, and put my interpretations in, but um, you know, but two rounds of it, let me, let me be able to do it. Well, there's so, a diminishing return, right? There's a diminishing there's a, return on correct. the time that you put into processing. Like I, speaking from experience, I spent months processing my dissertation data, right. months. And honestly, now looking back at some of that, fractionally better, right. very, very fractionally better. Were there some interpretations that I was able to make because of those, inter those processing steps? 100% yes. W are they drastically altering my original interpretations and my end result of the project? Not really. Right, right. And you're coming in and doing some excavation too. So it's like you exactly. picked out early in that whole process, the locations you were going to test, you know, bef before you spent two, three months, you know, on additional process. Yeah, I chose where I dug within the first 15 minutes of processing. Right. It right. was kind of getting additional details after that, that Correct. may or may not have right. been needed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of the point here. Uh, we have a few other questions we'll quickly answer and then we will jump off. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, um, what are the questions here? Looking for advice for the dipole antenna model uh, GPR. Okay, I'm not, so just as clear, and I always say this, I am not an electrical engineer. I've never built a radar. 
I tried to build a little robot that came with instructions with my son and I felt bad because we couldn't finish it. <laughs> right. So, um, I am, you know, we, we, we're application engineers. I mean, we've done this stuff on all sorts of applications and I think we do as good of a job as anybody else on earth, but we've never, we, we haven't built it. Right. So as far as a dipole, uh, antenna, I mean, we can give you guidance on what we use and what we sell and support because big, so big geophysical, the company, uh, um, you know, that, that, that I started and that, that Tyler works, uh, with me where he works with me. Um, we do sell and support a variety of different radar systems and other remote sensing and non-destructive testing technologies. So we only sell and support the stuff that we use in the field. And, um, and so if you want some guidance on what system you should get, we're happy to talk to you about it. Go ahead to bigmangeo.com, fill out the contact form, and we're happy to you know, get back to you and, and answer any questions you have. But if you're looking to, per to build one, I, I don't have advice for you. Um, thank you for the detailed answer showing and learning. Uh, appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's our pleasure. Are, all, are those all passes made? I'm not sure what, what that means. Are those all? I think on the time slice. So yeah, those are all the, the different trans transects. Yeah, so, so that's all 90. Okay, right. So if, if that's correct, then yeah, it's all 95 slices, right? So here I can go ahead and, first of all, we can turn off interpretations. Um, we could put this on. Right, so that's all. that was all the passes that we made. Right, those are all the passes. Um, and so, you know, it was 95. Again, Dominic did a great job focusing in mm -hmm. exactly where that, uh, septic tank was and was able to clearly identify it. Um, and so we have another question, what depths are possible yeah. with the units we sell? We, we, it's a wide variety. We offer multiple antenna, multiple brand units. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would say the one that we offer that's, that goes the deepest, um, is going to be a sensors and software system. It's going to be the ultra, uh, unit, uh, the ultra 100 with the noggin. And so depending on where, you know, you are and what the soil conditions are, um, I mean, that thing can see, potentially, you know, uh, 20, 30 meters mm -hmm. down. I mean, it's designed to go as deep as possible. It's real-time sampling. It's, you can do up to like 64,000 stacks on it. Um, it's meant to see deep, right? That was the point. And so, but we also sell, right, on the flip side, um, we sell, you know, see-throughs from IDS and we sell um, ProSec uh, uh, concrete scanning equipment, you know, which will be able to see in crazy detail, extremely small, objects and embedments. So it's a wide variety, but we sell all the way down to, to really 100 megahertz antennas um, that have, you know, uh, extra stacking on it and, and uh, can definitely see, you know, 20, 30. I mean, some of these folks in geology that are using this thing are seeing even more than that, you know, 50, 30 or 40 meters down. Yeah, it uh, just depends on the application. And so, right, it depends on where you are, right? Yep. And so if you're in central Florida, you're going to see very deep. And if you're in, you know, northern Georgia, um, you might not, you're not going to see as deep. Um, but it's still going to give you more penetration than a regular 200 megahertz or, or 400 megahertz antenna is going to give you, right? It's just by design, the frequency is going to, going to allow that, that greater depth. So that would be the one that goes the deepest. Mm -hmm. um, what depths are possible? Okay, let's see. And so everything in between, right? We also sell a dual frequency, which we use all the time. Uh, antenna from Leica Geosystems, uh, which has a 700 and a 250. So it's designed for utility locating. And it's great because it's efficient. And so it wraps both of those up, um, you know, into a, a, a single data acquisition. And so it gets things that are really small, that are shallow, but also identifies things that are larger and, and, and deep. And it does it at one shot. So wide variety from inches into the subsurface to 30 subsurface. Um, let's see. You guys are all welcome. So I think that's it from our end. We yeah. appreciate everybody thank you for commenting thank you for tuning in please again subscribe to the channel share this video on linkedin it would mean a lot to us if you shared it and you tagged us in it um it would really really mean a lot to us we're trying to do this stuff as much as possible trying to get free information trying to answer your questions and literally taking you through the stuff we did like this ain't perfect you know we don't we don't just doctor everything up to show you how beautiful things can be we are field people first Right. You know, we, we have gone, we've done hundreds of projects in the field in some of the worst conditions ever. And we're willing to show you what our mistakes were, what the issues were, what our successes were, right. And how you deal with things. So we're trying to give you straight up information that's relevant and useful to you. And we want to do it for other people in the field, in the industry. And uh, the only way to do that is if you can go ahead and, and recommend us or share us with one person uh, that you know, or go ahead and share us, you know, on a, this video with, with uh, somebody on another social platform.
Thank you all so much, Tyler. Any, any closing questions? No, I think we're good. Just like I said, emphasize the importance of utilizing all of the data your machine is giving you. Yeah. It's yeah. so important. People and often it, overlook things and it's really important to utilize everything that your machine is giving you to make the best interpretations and be the best practitioner of GPR. Absolutely. And again, right, that's including, you know, 3D, right, which you see over here, 2D, which we see on this side. And then even if you get into 1D, um, you know, bring it up just real quick before we sign off. And uh, yeah, I agree, uh, uh, Ali. You know, it is crazy to think waves travel through solid, solid material. Um, but even from the standpoint of of one D, you know, when 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 we're looking at at what's going on, you know, one D can still be really helpful. You know, as we kind of look at this, you know, and let me let me take the gain down actually a little bit. Uh, you know, using even the one D to identify polarity, you know, things like that. Using the one D to identify um, amplitudes, you know, is also really helpful. So, you know, 3D, 2D, 1D, all really relevant. And uh, like Tyler said, utilize all the, the system's giving you all this information. Like it's your fault if you're not utilizing it all. Yep. You know, so, all right, well, thank you all so much. Uh, we hope to see you again, I guess, you know, maybe next week or the week after that. Uh, but we'll do this, you know, on Thursdays, uh, Thursday morning, afternoon, where we are and whatever time it is where you are. So thanks again. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and and uh, see you all again soon. Take care. Bye.